Well, welcome to the Church and Family Life podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the perils of large families, and we got Michael Foster here to help us think it through. Hope you enjoy the discussion. Jason, we've had the joy of talking a lot about family life being fruitful and multiplying the the blessing of children, how God providentially makes your family. He opens and closes the womb. Um, And... uh, but then we, we bumped into this guy who talked about the perils of a large family. Um, I thought it was such a great article. Yeah, we're, uh, we're so often praising uh, l- large families as, as, as a concept, as being scriptural. Um, and we're pushing back against, you know, the general tide right. against that. But uh, this is uh, a man who is encouraging us to engage that uh, thoughtfully because it's not all, you know, uh, sunshine and our birds chirping. There are things that need to be thought through and, and considered. So, yeah. Hey, I mean, we, we want to pray the prayer of Rebecca's brothers, but we also want to offer offer the, the, the cautions. And, um, you know, Rebecca's brothers say, oh, you, our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands. We <laughs> like that, right? But uh, that's not all that you should think about if you're going to have a big family. So we've got Michael Foster with us. Hey, Michael. Hey, thanks for having yeah, me. Glad to yeah, be here. thank you. Uh, uh, Michael is the pastor of East River Church in Bat- Batavia, uh, Ohio. Hey, he wrote a really good book called It's Good to Be a Man. I read it. I thought it was a great book. Go out and buy the book. Um, it's good. But Jason, there's something else. Um, he wrote an annotation of Thoughts for Young Ben by J.C. Ryle. I, I'm always for that. So he, this guy almost <laughs> worships J.C. Ryle. <laughs> He's always true. quoting J.C. Ryle. Lies, loves worship. <laughs> <laughs> he loves J.C. Ryle. But anyway, so um, anyway, you, you got to go check it out. Yeah. And it, it's a really nice introduction. Okay, but we're here to talk about, Michael, what you wrote about the perils of a large family, uh, and we thought there was a lot of wisdom there. Tell us about why you wrote that. Sure. So I'm from a non-Christian family. I uh, grew up with uh, two younger brothers, and um, when I so I always had a positive view of children. My my mom did, and she's like one of those people that said, "Oh, if I if we could have afforded to have two more, we would have, and wish we would have had a girl." But you know, sometimes we bristle at that, but she meant it in a really positive way for a non-Christian. So I always wanted to have kids right away. And me and my wife would joke about having uh, a bus full of kids. It's hilarious looking back to that. We thought that was five. You know? <laughs> so five, five. Small bus. You know, five, se- five seemed like a, a whole lot. Um, so we got involved in some reformed churches after we got married that were uh, very um, pro-children. And I would say anti-contraceptive, uh, pretty strongly anti-contraceptive. And we had my son Hudson and then my son Athanasius. And then we got pregnant with uh, Cademan. And all that happened in about four years, a little over four years. And it felt fast to me. And we were uh, dirt poor at the time. And we were reading uh, in a men's group, Reforming Marriage. And Doug Wilson takes a sort of however many kids you can educate view, um, whatever that means. And um, I I wasn't super persuaded by that back then. Uh, And I I wanted to do this, do a study that would justify uh, contraceptive and not having children. So I did a big study. So yeah, 1930 Lambeth, all this stuff, like, (laughs) you know, all the things people are going to say, I've heard all that stuff. And, um, and then I be, I became convinced that you shouldn't ever do any form of, contraceptive and but i still was fearful that we're just going to have kid after kid after right. kid mm-hmm. my wife gets pregnant um and my wife is always very much uh pro having more children my wife gets pregnant with our first girl and the foster side of the family uh, of our 17 cousins uh there's only three girls and 14 boys so girls are, don't happen very much on that side of the family so i was blown away that we we're actually having a daughter we named her nicaea and I used to joke about how Emily had this um, tomb of iron, right? She just had these great pregnancies. And um, and so Nicaea, though, for some reason, uh, her heart gave out on uh, 39 weeks in. 
and died the day before her due date uh, on August 12th, uh, 2012. And that was a kind of a a life changing moment where, uh, you know, some people would think that'd make you not to want to have more kids, but it didn't. We saw how precious they were. And this assumption that you just can have lots of kids is not true. It's actually uh, in a fallen world, it can be very hard to get pregnant. A lot of us have friends that want to have a bunch of kids, but had multiple miscarriages and only had one or two or, or people that have like multiple stillbirths and these very painful things. So it, it God, God definitely used it to humble me on the sort of contraceptive stuff. But as I moved through life, I had lots of friends that are having, you know, uh, we it's common. I have not. I've had nine children with my wife, um, uh, including the one in heaven. But I, I have lots of friends that are anywhere between eight and thirteen kids. You know, um, and it's and we've seen the sort of toll that it's mm-hmm. taken on their marriages, on uh, the the wife's back, um, the difficulties that are arise. You know, you think the the years when they're little are hard. They might be sleepless. Uh, some nights, but there's a whole different range of difficulties that happen when you've got kids from one year old all the way up to 22 or whatever. And one of the most difficult times in parenting from I've observed, my oldest is will be 18 in, um, in the fall, but it seems to be when they're all out of the house and all you have is influence, right? <laughs> and like if they call you, uh, I've watched a lot of parents in their 50s and 60s that 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 become one of the most challenging times as I saw all those challenges, as much as I love children and I'm, and I'm for fruitfulness. And I think fruitfulness is normative. And, and I say, have sex and let your sex be fruitful. Um, but there are real challenges uh, attached to it and, and good things can be dangerous. Like all good things can be dangerous and there's a responsibility that comes with it. And we, we don't just have babies, right? We raise men and women. By it. We raise them up into adulthood, and and children that don't know the Lord uh, are one of the greatest pains that a Christian parent will ever experience in their entire life. It's one of the greatest woes, and so children can, if they reject God, grow into a curse, right? So a rot into the bone. And I wanted to write something that just helps as people right now, since really 2020, maybe even a few years before that, there's been a an awakening where people are questioning kind of the mainstream narratives and ideas, and they're they're grabbing old ideas back, but they're doing it in a very reactive manner, and uh, and they're like, yeah, we should have as many children as possible, and I'm like, okay, but you also like it's, you don't have just have children, you you raise them, you disciple them, you nurture them. There's like a whole thing, and some of you guys have no extended family. A nuclear family is not a biblical concept. There's no such thing in scripture. Scripture is an extended family. We know that because the man who won't provide for his own that's worse than an unbeliever is a man that doesn't provide for his mother or mother-in-law, right? It, the concept is broader, and so we have people like me who are a first-generation Christian that uh, we're re we're grabbing the productive womb, but we don't have the productive household or the extended family. And there's a sort of idealism that just needs to be checked. You just check. So you come into it sober um, because I have run into incredible numbers. I think of large homeschool families that are experiencing divorce and some wild behaviors in the mother's in their late 40s and early 50s, I could think of like 10 to 12 families. And people say, that's not a lot. But that's a pretty significant population of homeschool families with like 10 and 12 kids. It's like, they're not everywhere. And it's enough where I think like, hey, I think these people didn't take the gravity of this seriously. So my goal is not to scare people away from large families, but like, look, this is a great responsibility and blessing from the Lord, right? With each kid, level up, right? Get better, get more productive. The money, better at budgeting, uh, better at vision casting. You know all these sort of things you have to do. So that was the motivation. As someone who's from large family churches and and, and appreciates and believes it's normative, to just check that sort of idealistic. Yeah. Thing. So let let's talk about that's what I really appreciated about your article is you know you were really not not just giving thanks for the opportunity. 
of a large family, but the the responsibility. Every opportunity draws responsibility, and and that's what I thought was so good. Let's let's. One of the things you mentioned was you have to consider the scale of living that a large family creates. So, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I have three deep freezes, two fridges, four cars. I've got, <laughs> um, you know, I've got a whole lot of. Uh, clothing laundry is crazy. Um, we're looking at redoing our kitchen and putting in a industrial size dishwasher. Um, it's a lot like schooling. People say anyone can homeschool. I'm not so sure about that, but I'll tell you this much is that it's one thing to be a first grade teacher. It's another thing to be a first and a third and a second and a fourth and 11th grade teacher, right? Like it, it, things keep ramping up. And the scale that you of responsibility, uh, it, again, if you're taking this serious and you're growing with each kid through life, but everyone's like, these are unmitigated blessings. No, no, they're not. If you if you don't raise your kids up in the Lord, if you're not responsible, right, you're like the man in Proverbs who didn't take care of his own vineyard. And this thing that could be this productive blessing of vineyard, right, something you can hand down to a family, something that grows well now is uh, is really just a monument to your your failure of taking care of it. And it comes with nettles and broken down fences. It's, a, it's not a good thing, right? And so scale living is just the amount of food, the amount of clothing. Like we did, we did cloth diapers for a while because we were like every <laughs> stupid, crunchy family, right? Where it's like, oh, it'll save us so much money. Well, first off, uh, cloth diapers are disgusting. I don't care what anyone says. They're gross. It never lasts. Um, it never lasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then cleaning those things, the amount of time it takes to clean when you have a bunch of kids, mm -hmm. it changes. So I just, it, the scale is, people mm -hmm. say it's just the same as, no, it's not. It's more more responsibility. So step up. So I just like, this is like finding the vehicle. Think about vehicles, right? Like once you hit six, life changes. Now, Airbnb has made travel possible for large families. Right. Cause remember you just, you just have to like, uh, negotiate the truth with, uh, <laughs> hotels when you're trying to put kids in rooms and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, but now like you can do Airbnb, uh, but we, you know, we got this big uh, Conaline 350, um, you know, 15 passenger van. I love, we take the back seat out. So we can put groceries in there. But even when we travel cross country, which we've done a couple of times, like kids have their feet up on all their clothes and stuff because it's, it's just expensive. If that thing breaks down to replace it right now, like I'd be lucky if I could do anything as little, I mean, 14,000, 12,000, they're expensive. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. Yeah, and you've got to ask, what's the mean time before failure for my washing machine? Because it's going right. to right. run 10 hours a day. It's a you know? It does, yeah. Hey, one, uh, one of the things you said in your article, which uh, I, th I thought was helpful, was uh, while uh, scale does matter, it doesn't all happen at once. You don't go from one child to 10. So, so you do have time. But you have to do something with the time to uh, yeah. to to put things in place for that. So you you need to be thinking proactively about these things. You do, you you don't go from an economy size car to a minivan to a fifteen passenger overnight. But you have to be thinking about that trajectory. Amen. And the same thing is with managing your time as well, because things get so much more, you know, complex as children get older. You have to be really good with managing your own time because uh, that's the time that your family is subjected to, and a disorderly family is a disaster. We did a podcast on the on, on orderly families one time. I, did I, you say so? I, yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. And um, I got a lot of feedback on that. But you know, orderliness mm -hmm. is really important. If you're not an orderly family, you'll pay a price for it. Your kids will pay a price for it. So your your next category was loss of boundaries. What what do you mean by that? Yeah. So if you're growing with your children and being thoughtful, um, th this won't be a problem. But I have seen so there's, it could be a lot of people crammed into a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one thing that we're very careful about there's boy spaces and girl mm -hmm. spaces Amen. and family spaces, right? And um, we don't want 
the boys in the girl spaces. So the girls' room is the girl room, girl's room. So once the boys get out of like little, you know, like my son Cyprian really can't go in there anymore. He's like seven yeah. or whatever. But um, but he's like three or four or five, whatever. But that the girls are changing, especially as my daughter, uh, my my oldest daughter is moving into her teen years. We need those spaces to be tight. I won't let my girls walk around the house like in uh, in a uh, immodest way or whatever. Or my boys do it either. Um, when there's large families, it's really hard to keep eyes. Yeah on everyone yeah. and so you have to set these boundaries and enforce them without making it weird i mean that's the main thing like no this is what we do yeah. you, you're in your room you're in your room but you don't let them cross that stuff because i don't know what sort of people listen to this podcast but if you've been involved in large families you know that those boundaries matter because some bad things yeah. can happen yeah. people don't have an eye on it and so that would be uh some of it uh that that's the one that i think about most is just making sure the way that people have their own type of space, right? So that's, I think that's what I most. Yeah. And I, I found, you know, there, there are some people in the Christian community, they're very insensitive about matters of nakedness in their family. And so, and naive and, and naive, sensitive and, uh, yeah. naive about it. And, uh, and yeah. we want to just say a hearty amen to what you just said, because uh, we've seen the damage and dangers associated with being naive. And we want people who watch to just know we cannot afford to be naive in this category. Oh, they're brothers and sisters. Uh, yeah, you can't be naive yeah. about that. What I would say to that also is that you can, another boundary that I've seen, especially with little girls, is they can be moved into adulthood premature by being required to take care of their right. siblings in a way that's inappropriate. Now, everyone in a home pitches in, right? And so it's fine. I love watching my sons and daughters help the little kids and all that. But you do have to protect them from that because actually what you see a lot of lo the second generation out of a large family is that they tend towards a more moderate family and one of the, the complaints you'll hear from them is how they felt like they're like second mom or second right. dad and i i tell my oldest son i was like look you're a firstborn son privileges come with that responsibilities come with that but what our family needs is you to be the son and brother we don't need a second there mom, you go okay you yep. and and with my girls i protect their childhood and we'll just go hire a babysitter or something and uh so again there's responsibility because the problem with like these conversations is people don't know how to balance things it's like one extreme or the other extreme and like obviously you need this shared responsibility but also protect their childhood yeah and, and i think the bible makes the order of the family very very clear you know sons and daughters are are not parents they are sons and daughters Amen. and and keeping that clear. i've seen that that problem, you know, in different different times, and you know, and it's difficult. The reason it happens is because of just the scale. It's the scale problem. Again, how are you going to deal with it? And then parents default to delegating, but they delegate to the wrong people. Some things can't be delegated. You're the you're the parent. You know, <laughs> so, right. it's your job. Yeah. You also talked about physical and mental strain and. Uh, the things that you were writing, I've seen before. Just maybe fill that out a little bit from your perspective. Yeah. So with women, I see it happen a lot. Um, I think basically a woman will get her whole person gets totally swallowed up with the children in the household where she doesn't have her own hobbies anymore her own time and there's there's kind that kind of happens to all of us you know like i i remember mark driscoll and he's gone weird ways but he'd always tell people my hobbies are my kids right i, I appreciate that at one mm -hmm. level um but one is uh everyone needs to get away and clear mind a little bit and like my wife has a garden and we have a farm Right. And I told my wife, this farm just cost me money. These are the most expensive free eggs and <laughs> cucumbers. And if I wanted to make more money, it's not selling eggs. I'll go write another book or go speak or something. Certainly not these eggs. Right. I do this because it makes you happy. And this is your happy place. And you come and it refreshes you. So I do that. Also, 
uh, you know, the body going whoop, whoop, whoop. It's just like <laughs> growing, shrinking <laughs> every time, every kid, like the, the, the hard labor can really mess up your back. And I've seen a lot of women have had like anywhere from eight to 10 kids and they just barely can get out of the couch off the couch because they have a really messed up back. It's very hard to be a mother. Uh, so all this, it's just, it's constant. There's so many responsibilities, not enough sleep, whatever. And that, that takes a strain on people. And you'll look at some of these women from these large homeschool families that are 40 and they look 50. And I say, look, you're a husband. You know what the word husband means? You're supposed to be caring for this woman and giving her space. So we all like, look, you get uh, women get stretch marks from having babies. Men, sometimes we get pot bellies because we sit around in an office and we can't move around and we eat too much or whatever. We all like fall out of shape mm -hmm. at some level, right? There's a toil that life takes all of we, we hurt our backs. I've got a crooked thumb from different things. You know, you, you get messed up, but the kids, that's hard on the fear, like I remember after Nicaea died and my wife got pregnant, we had Irish twins. She got pregnant with Galilee and the full nine months, this baby was going to die in her head, mm -hmm. the full nine months, right? When you do stuff like that over and over again, it wears on people. And so it's like, look, you need to be very attentive to your wife. Like baby blues is a major deal. Like the, a postpartum depression that happens with when women can get a little crazy, and that that happens. It's a normal. It's it's pretty common in lots of women. So you have to be a, attentive. If you're going to have all these kids. You got to protect your uh, your your wife as well. They need a mom. They don't just need someone to birth them. They need someone to raise them and have that feminine influence in the house. You know, I uh, Deborah and I, my wife, we had four children, and um, my ch my kids have gone out and had a, a lot more children. Then we have my son is, you know, going on his ninth child. And I sat him down a few years ago and I said, David, um, you're not going to be able to live the way that I lived. Um, you're, I, I'm not your role model on a lot of ways. You're going to have to be powered up for your wife way more. You're going to, you're going to have to have more babysitters. We never had babysitters. Okay. You're going to have to buy babysitters. You're going to have to be really constrained with your work. You're going to have to be way more disciplined than I was with my work, blah, blah, blah. In other words, you can't live like your dad who had four kids because you're, you've are you upscaled this thing. And uh, I like how you frame this in terms of physical and mental strain. And I'm really grateful for him. I think he's done a really good job. Um, you know, having those own, his own personal boundaries and things like that. He's very disciplined. But uh, I think this is a real, you just have to, hey, we're not throwing shade on big families. We're just saying, if you no. got one, you know, you, you better, you better power up, you know, mm -hmm. and really take care of that family. Yeah. Hey, forewarned is forearmed. Yeah. Uh, to to mm -hmm. know in advance that this is what you're dealing with and that there are real implications when the number of children really starts to mount, uh, you should you should think through what it means in the different categories. And I, th I think that's what you've done is help us think through it in, d in the different categories. Yeah. Hey, I think that's, that's it, man. I really, really appreciate the wisdom about all this kind of stuff. You have any parting, you have a parting shot. We're, 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 we're out of time, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> No, uh, make love, make babies, make them into disciples, uh, finish the race. You know, life is a vapor. There you go. Praise the Lord. Good deal. Hey, thanks, man, for joining us. Yeah. All right. And thank you for joining us on the Church and Family Life podcast, and we hope you can be with us next time. Church and Family Life is proclaiming the sufficiency of Scripture by helping build strong families and strong churches. If you found this resource helpful, we encourage you to check out churchandfamilylife.com.